1994, my family welcomed a stranger into our home. We'd never met this man. He's from another country, and he doesn't even speak the English language. His name is Samir Mustafich, and when he first moved into our house, um, he came as a Bosnian refugee. He had been injured, and he, he needed some medical, uh, some medical care. And so he came to the States, and he lived with us for several years. And I remember when he first came there, like, what is this stranger doing in our house? We're literally living with the stranger. And he couldn't even tell us who he was because he didn't speak the language. We didn't speak a lick of Bosnian and he didn't speak a lick of English. I've since learned uh, how to sing Ring Around the Rosies in Bosnian. I'm a pretty, pretty big deal. But, but it was so hard in those early days to like, how do we have relationship with this guy, right? He doesn't speak English. There was very few English words he picked up on early. Like he went to the hospital and had surgery. And my mom was telling me one time he came home, pointed at his garbage can and used one of the only words that he learned in the hospital, a uh, pillowcase. What he needed for his garbage can was a liner, a garbage bag for it. But that was the only English word he knew. And Samir remained a stranger until we began to incorporate him into the rhythms of our home. And now Samir is a deeply loved part of our family because of time and intentionality. And today we're beginning our series, or we're continuing rather, our series on the Holy Spirit. And part of the reason why we've chosen this series is because I believe spiritually speaking, many of us are living with a stranger a person we don't know, named the Holy Spirit. And much like Samir, it takes time and intentionality and rhythms of relationship to begin to have deeper, intimate relationship with the God who is present with us right here, right now. And today we're gonna start in John chapter 16 as Jesus kind of paves the way for the Spirit to come. Now in John chapter 16, a little bit of context, Jesus is about to die. He, he's telling his disciples some last things moments before he's gonna go and be crucified. And he gives them some really bad news. He says, firstly, when, when you, uh, uh, those, the, the community that you're involved in, the synagogue, they're going to put you out. You're going to be ostracized from your, from your community, which was a place where Jewish people would go and they'd sit under the teaching of a rabbi who'd unpack the Old Testament. He says, you're going to be taken out of that community. You're going to be ostracized for following me, but it gets worse. In fact, there will be a day coming when people will think they're serving God by killing you. Man, that's a bleak future outlook, right? Like, I don't think anyone had that on their five-year plan. But Jesus is saying, look, this is coming. And then he adds worse news on top of it. Let's look at it. John 16, starting in verse 4. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks, where are you going? Jesus says, life's going to get really bad. And also, I'm leaving. Can you imagine what this felt like for the disciples? What do you mean you're leaving Jesus? These are men and women who have left home and job and family to follow Jesus. And I want to be clear, Jesus isn't just leaving them high and dry. He is leaving to accomplish the work that he set out to do, to bring salvation to many through the cross and the empty tomb. He's got important work to finish ahead of him. But can you put yourself in the disciples' shoes in this moment? What do you mean you're leaving? They've left everything to follow this homeless wandering rabbi. They've seen him do miraculous, powerful things. They've watched his life as he lives in perfect obedience to the Father, learning from him, loving him. Some of them at this point have, have come to the realization that he is the Messiah, the Christ. They can look him in the eyes. They can hug him. They can hear his voice. And now he says, I'm leaving. What would you feel in this moment? Now, if I'm there, I'm going to bear hug Jesus. Like, you're not going anywhere. They're going to have to pry me off of you, right? I know that's wrong, right? Peter tries to do something similar. He gets rebuked. But can you imagine the heart that they felt? Look at what it says here in verse six. Because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Sorrow has filled your heart. That's a weighty statement. This isn't just dabbling in sadness. 
This is overwhelming, grief-stricken sorrow at the reality that their rabbi, their teacher, their Lord is leaving. And then he adds a very perplexing statement to to the end of this conversation. Let's look at it. Verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. What? Like, it's great that you're here with us, Jesus. What do you mean it's to our advantage or it's better for us if you leave? I just imagine all kind of thought bubbles above the disciples' heads in this moment with question marks. Like, what in the world are you talking about, man? And he clarifies. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus says, it's actually better that my physical presence, that I leave and accomplish the work that I've set out to do so that I can send the spirit to be with you. And a couple chapters earlier, he clarifies in greater detail what this spirit, the helper, the Holy Spirit who will come, what this is going to actually look like. Let's look at it in John chapter 14. It says, and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. When the spirit comes, he's not going away again. This is a permanent thing that's going to happen. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you. And look at this last part and will be in you. He says, I'm sending the spirit, but he's not just going to kind of eat the real, like be around you and this. No, he's going to be within you. Now there's a reality that under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit, God did not dwell within people. We see in the old covenant that he would come upon people, uh, usually for uh, a season of leadership, a king or a prophet, and he would come upon them for that season and then he would leave. But, but here Jesus says, it's not just that the Spirit is going to be with you or, or come upon you. He's going to dwell within you. This would have been a radical idea to a Jewish mind of this day because they know uh, there's a visceral reminder for them, the separation between God and man. That reminder is called the temple. And at the temple, the complex of the temple, there was many courts. There was a court of the Gentiles. They had a court for women. And, but there was, in the inner workings of the temple, there was a place called the Holy of Holies, where God's presence resided. And in front of that, there was this ornate, beautiful, huge curtain that separated holy God from sinful humanity. And, and to go behind that temple, you had to do, go through all kinds of ritual purifications and preparations. You could only do it one time a year. And it was a priest who did it. And they still tied a rope around his body in case he died in the presence of God. They had to pull his body out. Jewish minds were very clear about the separation between God and man. This was a place where they would come and offer sacrifices and offerings and worship. And even with the right heart, And the right sacrifices, they could not go into the holy of holies. And Jesus says, there's going to be a new way that God dwells with his people. In fact, that God dwells within his people. So how is this possible? If there's this deep separation between God and man, how can the Holy Spirit come and dwell within God's people? It's Jesus. Look at this. Matthew chapter 27. Jesus at this point has been through trial after trial after trial. He's been beaten. Now he's hanging on a cross and and he's dying. And here's what it says, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In this moment, this is so pivotal. I hope you know this and rest in this truth. In this moment, Jesus takes the sin of the world upon himself. Your sin, past, present, future, my sin. He takes it upon himself. And in this moment, he drinks the cup of God's wrath. Every last drop. God's holy, righteous anger towards sin is poured out on Jesus. And because Jesus becomes sin, the Father turns away. And the cry of Jesus' heart is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
because sin caused the separation, just like sin is what separates holy God from sinful humanity. As Jesus takes the sin of the world upon himself, there is a, a separation. In Jesus' own words, there's a forsaken. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, verse 51, check this out. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The very curtain we were just talking about that separates holy God from sinful humanity because of Jesus' finished work that he dealt with sin once and for all. That curtain rips in half. Can you imagine being the priest who was there doing evening sacrifices in this moment? I didn't do it. It was a new guy, right? Like they know how serious this curtain and the presence of God behind it is. And Jesus, because of his death, inaugurates a new way that now God is not going to live in temples built by human hands, but he's going to dwell within his people. This is a beautiful truth. And Jesus's death causes a ruckus, right? The temple curtain tears in two, the earth shake and the rock splits. This is a moment where there's this visceral reality and a demonstration that God is now going to be dwelling within us by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's where we're going today. The point on your outline, he indwells us. He indwells us. This Holy Spirit, who we're talking about through this whole series, he is the personal presence of God, the Spirit within you. He indwells. You know, when we say indwell, it is the word that's used in the ESV a couple of times about what the Spirit does in the life of a believer, but it's not a common word that we use often. Like I don't, when I invite you over, I don't say come to my dwelling. I say come to my house, right? But when we say indwells, what we mean is to take up a permanent residence within. That's what we mean here. The Holy Spirit by the finished work of Jesus and our placing our trust in him. If we're in Christ, he has taken up a permanent residence within us. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6. It says it this way. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. That's pretty intense. God takes his temple very seriously. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Notice, he doesn't say you're God's home. He doesn't say you're God's vacation property. He doesn't say you're God's rental or apartment complex. He says you are God's temple. It's very intentional language. You're not just God's home. You are God's temple. Temples were places that was uh, approached with much honor and reverence because of the God within. Specifically, the temple in Jerusalem was approached with much reverence, worship, and, and honor, not because of the temple building itself, but because of the God who dwelt there. And here he says, you are God's temple because God's spirit dwells within you. You are an honored, revered place because the spirit of God dwells within you. And I, in writing 121 at college, um, I, I, my teacher taught me this linguistic device called a syllogism, and we can use it here. So it's where you take two statements and you can deduce a third from the two uh, and their context, all right? So here, we're going to use this. You are God's temple, statement number one. God's temple is holy, statement number two. If you are God's temple and God's temple is holy, the statement we can deduce from that logic is you are holy, Look, he even says it here at the end. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. What I want you to see is you are holy. You're holy. You, you're not too dirty or filthy or sinful for the spirit of God to dwell within you. You are holy. Do, do you believe that? And when I talk about holiness, what I mean is moral perfection before the God of the universe. You are holy in the sight of God. We live in this beautiful mystery in the gospel that positionally before God, you and I are holy, morally perfect. Not because of any good works we do and, and stopping all the bad stuff. Nope. It's because of the finished work of Jesus. That moment we just read about on the cross where he died for us in our place. That's what makes us holy. And when God looks at you and I, he says, righteous, perfect, holy. 
Do you believe that? Let's come back to this verse. Four times in these two verses here, he uses the word temple. And I did a little bit of digging, like, what does he mean, temple? And the word that he uses in the original language, and I apologize, I can't remember if it's Greek or Aramaic or uh, what the original language was for this word, but the word is naos, N-A-O-S, naos. And here is how it's defined. It is used of the temple at Jerusalem, but only of the sacred edifice or sanctuary itself, consisting of the holy place and the holy of holies. So the temple complex, there was courts for the Gentiles and courts for the women, but there was a, the sacred edifice, the sanctuary, the place where the holy of, holy of holies resides. That's the word that he uses here for temple. He says, you are the temple, you are the naas, you are the holy of holies where God dwells within. Do you believe that about yourself? Do you believe that you're holy? Look, it's often hard to believe that because our life does not always match up to that reality. Am I right? Whether in thought, word, or deed, we blow it usually daily, right? I know I do. But you're holy. That's what God says about you. But it's so easy to inform our identity around what culture tells us or what our family of origin said or, or words that were spoken over us that were lies. It's easy to shape and form our identity based on all of these other realities, uh, other influences rather, instead of what God says. A couple years ago, I was... <clears throat> in a, a meeting uh, with the teaching team. I was early on in the teaching team and uh, Pastor Paul Glazener was sitting across from me and um, he kind of doodles in meetings. I don't know if you know this about Paul, but he kind of doodles in meetings and uh, he's a pretty good artist actually. And uh, so after the meeting, he comes up to me and, he, and he's talking shop and I kind of peek at his paper and what did he draw? But yours truly. And it looked like a courtroom sketch of a serial killer on trial. I had those giant 1970s uh, glasses and it just looked like I was on trial. And I was like, oh my word, is this how Paul sees me? Oh no. And it, and it was a silly moment, but it revealed something about me. My identity is far too often informed by what, how other people see me. Now, Paul doesn't see me that way as a serial killer uh, or, or somebody who'd be on trial, but, but I got into this, man, do I need to shape and mold myself based on what I see here? Do you believe you're holy? Or have you shaped and molded and believed lies about your identity? Or have you rested in this truth? Listen, we will never have intimate, deep relationship with the Holy Spirit, if we don't believe this truth, we'll just continue to live with a stranger because what we'll really believe is we're not worthy of relationship with him. We're not worthy of him residing here. And if you're in Christ, he dwells within you already. You don't have to merit it. You don't have to earn it. You have to show your value enough to receive him. No, he's part of the gospel gift. He dwells within you. You are the naas. You are the temple. You are the holy of holies where this Holy Spirit resides within you. Do you believe that? The second thing I want us to see is that he is present. He is present. If you are the temple of the Spirit, you, this is that permanent residence, like I talked about earlier, the permanent residence of the Spirit within you. That means you bring him to every situation, every conversation, every mountaintop, every dark valley, every interaction with your family, every day at work, every time you're hanging out with friends. He is with you all the time. Relationship is defined by presence. This was a statement that Pastor Drew from the art campus, as we were talking about uh, the Holy Spirit and that he indwells us, he said, relationship is defined by presence. And the Holy Spirit has made his definitive statement about how close he wants to be with you by choosing you to be his temple. So are you experiencing his presence? Are you aware of his presence? Or are you living with a stranger? He's present. He's among you. He's close. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to a temple or a holy person or a, a priest or a church or a pastor or a ministry leader or a mature Christian. If you're in Christ, you have God within you. 
He's with you all the time. There's no circumstance that you're going through that he's like, yeah, I'm going to take a rain check. I'll be back later. No, he's with you all the time. You don't have to go anywhere. And I'm afraid Christianese does a lot of injustice to this theology. And it comes out in statements like, you need to go to God or go to God in prayer. Or even the statement, if you feel distance from God, guess who left or guess who walked away? You can't walk away from someone who dwells within you. And I understand that what those statements mean, that you, know, you, you need to turn to God and trust God, but you don't have to go anywhere. He dwells within you. He's present. Relationship is defined by presence and he's made his definitive statement about how close he wants to be to you. He's here. He's with us. He's close. He's that comforting, peace-giving, encouraging, helpful empowering presence in your life. Are you aware of that? Several years ago, we took our daughter on her first backpacking trip. Um, and we were, we were several miles up into a high, uh, high mountain lake and we had set up shop. And the weather has this habit of every Wednesday in the middle of our backpacking week for four years in a row, we had a lightning storm. And sure enough, Wednesday rolls around. I don't know what the deal is with Wednesday. Maybe because the, the weather is like, let's just get over this week already. But it rolls in and the, the blue skies turn to black and, and it's pouring down rain and the thunder's rumbling and the lightning striking. And we all try and huddle inside our waterproof tents. We had two little two-man tents, my wife and I in one and my father and daughter in another. And as we're sitting there in the pouring rain, over the rain, we can hear our daughter crying, sobbing because she's scared. We were close, but we weren't with her. We weren't present in that space with her. And so we hop out of our tent and all four of us kind of cram into this little tiny two-man tent, got a little <laughs> weird because we smelled funky after a half a week of hiking. But my daughter climbs up onto my wife's lap and my wife just kind of bear hugs her from behind. And what happened? Peace, calm, my, my daughter's chaos turned to peace. Her fears turned to calm. Why? Not because mom changed anything. Thunder's still rumbling. Lightning's still striking. Downpour's still happening. But she was present with her. This is a picture of the Spirit. There's nothing you walk through that He's not there with you, empowering you, loving you, comforting you, pointing you back to Jesus. That's his job. He continues to say, don't forget the gospel. Don't forget what Christ did for you. Pointing to Jesus, reminding you of the glory of Christ's love that he would die in your place. He's present always. Have you experienced his presence? Or is it just something that you know? The third thing I want to challenge us to in light of the fact that he indwells us, we are called to live as his temple. And I want to just kind of preface this and just pause for a moment. Um, I realize when we talk about obedience, that's where we're going, obedience, holiness, the pursuit thereof, okay? When we talk about that, there's a natural tension that comes up because the gospel says you're forgiven apart from works. It, it's a free gift of grace. You don't earn it. And yet in the gospel, we're called to obedience and surrender and holiness. And there's a natural tension that arises there between free gift of grace and the call to obedience and holiness. And so we're going to try and just thread a needle here. But I think you'll see very clearly that since he indwells us, since we have this unchangeable truth, it's not changing. It's a permanent residence within the life of a believer. Since that's true of us, it does inform how we should live. Look at it here in 1 Corinthians. Again, uh, Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians. The Corinthians had some, some theology that was going kind of wayward and, and they had some... <coughs> An outworking of that theology that that was not uh, that, that that was really a bad thing in the church, and so Paul writes to correct them. And in this chapter in particular, he's writing them and he's saying, "Look, how you're conducting yourselves is not okay." Specifically, he's calling out uh, before these verses, he calls out sexual immorality. 
He says, this does not accord with who you are. Flee from sexual immorality. And then he goes into this deep theology here. Look at this, verse 19. Or do you not know, again, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Isn't that the question we're wrestling with right here? Right? They've been wrestling with it too. This is something that God's people have always wrestled with. Don't you know you are the temple and God's spirit dwells within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. In the flow and context of this passage, Paul is talking about how we live our life, that we are called to obey God, that we are called to glorify God. And he says this word so here. Anytime we see so or therefore in the Bible, it links what came before with what you're going to be asked to do next. And he says, since you are a temple, so because of that truth, unchangeable, it is, it is the reality of who you are. Glorify God in your body. Your life should match up to that reality. Now listen, I am not saying that if your life doesn't match up, you're not a temple. But I am saying we're called to reflect the glory of God as his temple. That's the role of a temple. Temples reflected the glory of the God within. Specifically, the temple in Jerusalem reflected the glory of God. It was made with an ornate, handcrafted artistry, intentionality in every dimension and every single piece that was crafted for it to reflect the glory of Yahweh. And now we're the temple of God. And we're called to reflect the glory of the God who dwells within us. Now, this doesn't happen perfectly in the life of anybody, right? Remember, we are positionally holy. God, even on our worst days, still looks at us and says, righteous, holy, perfect because of the work of Jesus. But it should be increasing in our life. We are called to a process called sanctification, where you're growing in maturity, in holiness and righteousness. This is something that the temple of God is meant to reflect the glory, the beauty, the majesty, and the power of the God who dwells within. So I want us to be okay asking the question, am I reflecting the glory of God? Not perfectly, but increasingly. Am I reflecting the glory of God to the world around me? That's my job as a temple. And here's the cool part. You don't do it alone. The Holy Spirit who indwells you empowers you to do this work. You can't do it on your own. Like the gospel, with, or trying to live the gospel in obedience without the Holy Spirit is just legalism. You cannot live out the, the commands of the New Testament apart from the indwelling power of the Spirit. And yes, you're called to live as a temple, but you don't endeavor to do that on, on your own. You don't try and drum up your own holiness. No, you say, God, where am I not reflecting your glory in my life? And meet me in those spaces. Holy Spirit, empower me to change as I surrender to you. And so I'd encourage you today, after, after service, have a conversation with a trusted friend or your spouse about this very question. God, where am I not reflecting your glory in my life to the world? And ask for accountability to help in that area. You are holy. He is present with you. And it's because of that, that we can live as his temple. I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. Thanks for joining. All right. Thank you so much for sticking around. It's a joy to get to share with you today. And I just want to leave us with two really practical ideas of how we can begin to experience and incorporate the spirit into the rhythms of our life so that we're not living with a stranger. All right, the first one is the blessed rhythm. This should not be new to you. We've talked about this quite a bit. But the blessed rhythm is a rhythm of listening to the Spirit in the mission that God has for us. And it begins with prayer. B, begin in prayer. That you're listening. Holy Spirit, where are you working? What are you calling me to? Who are you calling me to love or serve or, or uh, to invite into my home? And then the second one is as you get clarity about who God's drawing you towards, you listen to their story. 
You ask questions. You listen more than you talk. And then you invite them into your life unabashed, eating, serving, sharing with them your story and how Jesus transformed your life. This is a rhythm. We want to challenge uh, certainly uh, all of our campus and the online community to be doing this daily. Begin every single day in the blessed rhythm. God, where are you working around me? Help me to join you in that by living out this listen, eat, serve, and share. And the second one is really just a, a personal spiritual nourishment tool that has been really enriching to me. It's called Lectio 365. It's an app. You can find it in your Play Store. Um, and it, the idea is it takes an ancient um, way of reading scripture called Lectio Divina, which just literally translates to divine reading. Um, and it, it, it's a, the basic gist of it is reading small portions of scripture and asking the question, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Holy Spirit, why does this word stand out? Or what does this phrase mean? Or, and it, it, you read through it, you're asking and praying through it and, and asking those questions. And you go back and you read through it and pray through it again. And you go back and it's often three to five to seven times, a small portion of scripture, praying through it with the Spirit, listening for his voice, for his presence with you there in that moment. And so these are two really very practical tools to begin to have rhythms of relationship with the Holy Spirit. Father God, thank you so much that you sent your son to die in our place. And I pray in this moment, as we remember, uh, rem remember what he's done, that we would rest in those truths. And Jesus, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit that lives within us, empowering us, loving us, comforting us, and pointing us back to the finished work that you accomplished on the cross and the empty tomb. And Jesus, God, Spirit, I ask that in this moment of holy communion with you, that we would not just intellectually know what you've done, but that we would experience your grace in a deeper way. In Jesus' name, amen.